You know what you get the honor of being, you know? Right. You're the very first in person in the actual like stupid lair ever in the history of <laughs> stupidity. Well, you only get to be stupid once, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so uh, much for joining us no, uh it's... we've we've literally been like i think you saw our first reaction to it which i believe was you with Ramon at berkeley yeah. so you saw that i saw a couple yeah i saw like two i think yeah. i just rewatched it again to remind myself because it was like so a year ago young in those videos yeah. well oh my God. i think you can tell from like our takeaway we went into that like okay cool it's gonna be ar Ramon, and the thing ends and all we're talking about is who the freak was that bassist <laughs> That's the, that yep. was the reaction. 100%. So yeah, we've been obviously and everybody and then we got to learn more about you and how talented you are. And so thank, thank you, you so much for coming on. Yeah. We really, really it's appreciate it. Um, so I guess the, the first question would be how? How did I get into music? No, just or... how, how do you do it? How do I do it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah like how, okay, so this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a linked question. I'm so. Kidding. Clearly with the accolades and the people you get to play with, you recognize the level at which your capacity is as a bassist right. and, and you're not normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're when, normal. when did you first realize that your capacity, which is, I know is a combination of just innate gifting as well as just hard freaking work. Uh, when did you recognize, wow, I'm better than the average bear? Um, I think so here's a little backstory. Yeah. Uh, my mom and dad, they're both musicians. My mom is a singer and my dad is a bass player. So music was always floating in the house. My mom uh, also has uh, a master's degree in uh, dance, Kathak actually. And uh, she used to have a dance school in Calcutta. And I remember I have these vague memories of me wearing this white charidar with like orange dupatta and just standing by her side and taking dance lessons from her, right? And then, uh, then, we moved to Mumbai. Um, again, a lot of people think that I was born and brought up in Calcutta. No, I was born and brought up in Mumbai. So okay. I'm a Bombay bong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the last time I went to Calcutta, I probably was nine years old, mm -hmm. actually. I have to go back, man, it's a long time. It's been a long time, but coming back. Um, so Indian classical music and jazz music, because my father um, was playing with Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, he has played with Bon Jovi, he has played with Hariji, like Adnan Swami, a lot of like everybody in the Bollywood industry, um, except, except AR, right? And uh, I always wanted to become, I was very uh, inclined towards fashion, I was very inclined towards uh, glitter and anything artsy, right? And I was playing around with my mom's saris, I would cut up like her saris and make clothes out of it. I would wear them on the streets and everyone's like, she's weird, man. Like, what is it? <laughs> you know, like torn stuff she's wearing. I would like wear torn pants and like tube tops and stuff. And back in the days, Mumbai was still not that uh, open no, about like, ask, you know, yeah. like wearing like really deep neck stuff on the streets and stuff. And I was doing it, like I was very rebellious. Mm -hmm. Um, so even my parents were not that open-minded back then. So they were like, oh, don't wear those kind of things. You know, you will attract the wrong people, this and that. And I'm like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do what I want to do. And uh, I started, um, I applied for a fashion college. I got selected and stuff. But that was also the same time when I got two other golden opportunities, which, which was I got called to be a part of A.R. Rahman's band. And I got offered a full scholarship from Berkeley College of Music. And this was after my 10th board exams. So this is like, I, I never graduated. I never got a degree, nothing. This was like still junior, like school, right? Do you guys still call that? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and 11th, 12th after that is junior college still. So it's still not like college, college, but in India, we call it just junior college. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did my 11th standard and then I couldn't give my exams and I stayed home because I was touring too much and my health was getting affected and stuff. And then I, was, and I told my dad, I just cannot, I just cannot. Cause I started professionally working at the age of nine. And by that time I was already like 13 and I was traveling the world. I already had like 
my passport full of stamps, you know, and uh, I told that like, I cannot continue studies. I just cannot. It's not helping me. And he was like, are you sure you are going to pursue this like seriously? And are you sure you're going to be able to be independent? Because I don't want any guys in the future to point fingers at you, you know, and be like, oh, I'm going to pay you and you're going to be the housewife. I never want that for you, yeah. you know? So he didn't, he was very like forward with that type of thinking and he wanted me to be very independent and stuff. And then, uh, so I did my 11th and 12th as a private student through correspondence directly from Mumbai University. And uh, I got like, I think 86% uh, with all the touring, which was great. And, um, and then I decided I don't want to study anymore. And I just took, um, so the three golden opportunities that time I chose to be in ARS band. I, I turned down the full scholarship. The last time anybody uh, got full scholarship from Berkeley College of Music was Esperanza Spalding. So mm -hmm. they were giving that to me with everything, right. like, including everything. And I was confused, like, oh, you know, sure, yeah. as a kid, like, you don't know what to do. There are three amazing opportunities. One is like, I can go into my fashion, you know, college and yeah. uh, learn everything and do all the things that I've always wanted to do because I was so into fashion and makeup and all these things. Um, but somewhere deep in my heart, something told me that I've put in, put in so many years of practice. I've put in so many years of sleep, sleepless nights and um, gone days without sometimes not even eating, you know, mm -hmm. and just like putting my heart and mind into something that my dad wanted me to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, maybe I should give it a shot and just see where it takes me. Because fashion is something, it's so closely related to performers, sure. you yeah. know? I was like, I can always do that. I can go back. I'm still young. I can always do that. And I will always have a great relationship with Berkeley College of Music, right? Um, so I chose to be in AR's band. Unknowingly, I had already worked for AR. I didn't even know. I played, recorded on one of his songs for his movies because I used to go into Nirvana Studio, which was owned by Ranjit Barrett, um, who now plays for John McLaughlin, yeah, another yeah. favorite guitar player. Um, and he um, used to call me for these jingles, background scores for movies and stuff. So I was going in, playing, doing my okay. work, never asking like, right. you know, who's well, it? who, who is, is this it? for? Right. Like, I'll just go and play and come back. So it was one of those things. And then I get to know that it was AR song. The movie was called Lekar Ham Divana Dil and the song was called Too Shining. Very simple, nothing exciting. It was just like a rock and roll song, you know? So I did my thing, one hour, out, done. I was fast. I, going into moving on to next project mm -hmm. you know I was very busy and then I get a call from him saying that hey um, uh, I saw some of your uh, uh, you know appearances on the other coke studio episodes I was already working for coke studio for, for some other episodes other yeah. artists right uh, would you be interested in being a part of mine I was like oh absolutely and uh, I think he probably didn't expect such a calm you know reply yeah. so it was like okay great awesome see you that's it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then um his production team called me up and you know all the commercial yeah. business business stuff and then the first time i meet him was at whistling woods at reliance studios uh, -huh. uh where a coke studio rehearsals were happening and that was the first time i also met Sivamani, prasanna ramaswamy keva jeremy all these other band members who who uh were already working for AR, right? Ranjit Akul was not in the picture that time. Yeah. Um, and he came in and he came on the second day. The first day was just us kind of getting to know each other, musicians. And I was like, what, 15 or 16? And I never used to talk. I would nod my head to say <laughs> yes or no. And then um, it's not like I was not confident. I was very confident, but I didn't want to be perceived as arrogant or over smart. Yeah. for her age because they are all elders right yeah. and there's some type sure. of respect that goes in and me being a first timer in that type of space i wanted to be like really relaxed and if something is asked i want to say yeah anyway so the rehearsals start and everything goes by and then uh, we rehearse our songs and then zaria happens and uh, i remember going to a you know a writer's block happens. yeah oh yeah yeah so that happened in zaria in the intro part after the whole like the beautiful intro part yeah with the airy spacey kind of yeah. vibe and that block happened and we didn't know how to proceed in the song i had an idea what if i 
play like a bass line. Yeah. So that bass line you hear, da -da 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 so instead of saying anything, I just started playing that, and I was like, okay, let's do that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my journey took off. Yeah. He knew that I was not only playing parts, was able to play parts, but also had orchestration in my mind, also yeah. had creative vision in my yeah. mind. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I was going to hire Tao Wilkenfield for Coke Studio, but when I heard you, I only <laughs> wanted you. And so that was a big compliment for me. Yeah. I didn't even know how big he was until I played there with yeah. him. And then I went back and I Googled and I was like, oh, he's... He has Grammys, he has yeah. Oscars. <laughs> yeah. Great, awesome. Yeah, that's all, yeah, we actually just interviewed him uh, about, a, about a week ago. About a week ago. Yeah, oh, wow, uh, awesome. so he's now our dost. Um, yeah, but, dost. <laughs> yeah. And everybody we interview, they instantly <laughs> become <laughs> our dost. dost. Uh, <laughs> you can thank Pankaj for that. Yeah, yeah Pankaj Pankaj for um, But so, yeah, you've obviously worked with him many, many times. Now you're part of his band for, for a long while. Eight and a half years, yeah. to be exact. Wow. So, yeah. what, uh, what were some of the things that, that you learned from him um, as one of the greatest composers of all time? Right. Um, when I joined his band, I joined his old band. Mm -hmm. um, so Sivamani was still playing, Keva was still playing. Uh, there was no persona. It was, that, was, that lineup was only for Coke Studio. I worked with that old band for two years almost. And then Ranjit Uncle came into the picture where he came, became uh, the music director of the band. And then he kind of cherry picked other musicians uh, with two keyboard players, two guitar players, um, himself on drums. A um, bunch of singers like Niti Mohan, uh, sometimes Arijit came, Benny Dayal, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I had already worked with these singers before, but the band was new. Mm. So I was, you know, getting introduced to a lot more people in the music industry. Uh, and then uh, one thing about AR is like he doesn't really come for rehearsals. He will come like on the day of the show in the morning, run like a whole set, and he's done. Sometimes he'll add new songs which sometimes is very, uh, you know, like, oh no. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I remember when uh, Mark joined the band, he added like 10 songs on the day of the show. And added 10 like, songs. Gave you charts for them, right, Mark? Nope. <laughs> oh, God. No. No. We, You're joking. And we, made, we made all the horn parts the same day, the, the night before. So he gave us a ton of homework. We were up all night. I bet you had a ton and of homework. We, and we were literally sight reading the charts in front of like 40,000 people. Yeah. I mean, I be, <laughs> being, being able to speak Marathi, Hindi, English, Bengali, yeah. I obviously know when things are coming. Mm -hmm. Because of the language, because of the language. understanding, right. yeah. Like I know when the melody is kicking in. With him, it was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? But that's kind of. I, I would imagine that's kind of when you're at the level that AR is at, and, and you're at, and you're at. When we talk about that all the time. Like when we we'll, we'll listen to a score of a film, and sometimes we'll bring up to stupid babies the fact that. When you're at that level of musicianship, you typically don't get to see anything until it's time to go. You're always put on the spot. Yeah, you're expected always. to know it and be oh, able yeah. to do it. Yeah, yeah. And I think my Konako background, like the Karnatic culture right. that I had, because I was also playing with a lot of fusion uh, musicians from Chennai, Kochi, all these other parts, where I had the understanding of... Uh, uh, different gharanas, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, different syllables of um, Konako. So I was able to apply that on AR's music, you know, and I think he liked that blend and the voice that I had, uh, which was like the rhythm section was so uh, Western, mm -hmm. um, infused with his Indian melodies. The blend was just really beautiful. Mm -hmm. that, that makes me think of a question I want to ask you that goes more into like technique and theory and the, sure. di the differentiation between because you you clearly understand Western and Eastern. My, ex my exposure to music has only been Western until recently aside from the random thing I've been able to hear mm -hmm. but as far as like understanding Western music. So it's kind of a two-part question. In Western music, you've got, you know, seven modes and you've got these modalities that you play in and that's pretty much where you go and you do the variations from. Yeah. I have no idea how many different modalities there are in oh, Eastern music. So many. Yeah. I, I, I imagine they're kind of it just a lot of ragas. A lot of ragas, lot right? Of ragas, so yeah. how how much and I guess it depends on what you're playing. How, how much of that informed your education as a bassist? Was it a blend of them equally? Was it far more one versus the other? Uh, 
I was very fortunate that I was hopping in and out of different situations, playing in AR's band, playing with a lot of Carnatic musicians, playing with Uncle Louis Bangs, who is also a Grammy Award winner. Uncle, he's like in his late 70s now, still, you know, playing, killing keyboards, you know? And he, his music is very jazz contemporary. So I was playing like jazz standards with him. So I was, and with Ranjit Awa, it was like polyrhythmic, mm -hmm. or like odd time signatures, right. you know? So I was hopping in and out of different, um, types of music and of course AR which was very very um not Bollywood exactly but like pop but Indian pop ish right. you know um it had it it's set of like different uh in and out kick-ins of different types of like sometimes rock and roll sometimes like blues different songs here mm -hmm. and there you know and uh at home I was also writing my own music so when I'm doing my own practice I was working on all of these things mm -hmm. which is which is all personal practice. Now, you're not gonna be able to apply all of that into like AR songs because you are a groover in that type of band, right, you right. know? Um, but I was working on myself so that I could navigate through changes, which is, you know, jazz, like right. you know, being able to solo over uh, chords, right. uh, different set of chord changes. And uh, what if I go to LA? I was thinking at that time, like, what if I go to LA and play with uh, a set of jazz musicians? Like if they put a chart in front of me, I, I need to be able to read and write. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to navigate through these changes and being able to play parts, be able to play parts and stuff. And so I trained myself like that when I would be at my place. I actually moved out of my parents' place at like 18, got my own place, like a couple of blocks away and I would lock myself in the room and just like spend days and sleepless nights just practicing on myself sometimes get depressed like oh shit that's not happening mm -hmm. like I really need to be stronger you know wow. um, but one thing I knew deep down is that when I started playing with these stronger musicians it it realized I realized that I need to be stronger mm -hmm. I need to be able to be more powerful to be able to keep up with these musicians and in in result being you know being able to gain more information you know so that i can go out in the other parts of the world and be able to do these things mm. so i think it for me i was fortunate able to fortunate enough to be able to pick up equal parts from different sure. cultures sure you know yeah um yeah yeah, yeah you're you're uh like he just said you've been part of a lot you're currently part of a who's a japanese band the yes bees, right yeah. the bees yeah they kick ass by the way I yeah. know, but I listen to a bunch yeah, of yeah it stuff. was hard like three hours on like six seven inch heels on stage constantly it, i had head banging that was the first time i didn't even know that existed inside of me yeah you uh -huh. know like it, i just great, great I hair for saw a different yeah. type of yeah no, literally, there were like three people put ice pack on my neck after the show and take off my heels. <laughs> yeah, it was something. What yeah. are the biggest differences from, like, let's say Japanese? Like, if you're doing a concert in in, in Japan, it, with that music, a you know, concert in India with Eastern music, and or the somebody a band right. that you play with here. What are the biggest differences between all those? Reading, writing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in Japan, people are very, very scripted. They want their shows to be exactly the same, uh, even your solos. Like, you need to write out your solos. It has to be exact because really? they don't want to take even 1% chance of giving out a different type of um, show the next night. So we toured for four and a half months and I had the same exact solo every night. It wow. changed a few times because I'm very spontaneous that way. Yeah. Coming from India, from it Indian was music, hard, yeah. restricting. Yeah. Like, oh my yeah. God, yeah. Because they are so scripted and um, their production was just so high level. Yeah. They wanted to work the lights with my solo. So I had like oh. a five minute open space in the center. They were working the lights with everything. Okay. They had oh, people yeah. do things in the audience, throwing things in the audience. It's almost like with... a Broadway show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. It, it's all programmed, yeah, you know? know so they want to do that. Like they want to work with you, you know? Mm -hmm. But they want to know everything you're doing in the solo. So my techie is like when I'm soloing, he in the back is operating my pedals. He knows exactly what I'm wow. going to do. Yeah, which was very different. Never done that wow, before. Wow, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> How did Whereas, that feel? Jeez. Very different, like yeah. I said. It was the first time, yeah. obviously. Uh, whereas in ARs, when you do everything yourself, sure. you know, of course, you have a techie who will set up everything, but like you operate your pedals, you know? Mm -hmm. And then when, uh, oh man, I just remembered something. I was wearing this gown in ARs show and it got stuck while 
you know, walking down the staircase in one of the bigger shows where I was on a riser and I could not get on time in the center and uh, my solo was cut because of that. Because oh, no. I, you when they put a spotlight, there. there was nobody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I was stuck on the staircase and I had to play the rest of the show. It was just two songs left after that. And I had to stand on the staircase and play the rest of the show. <laughs> and wow. I was like, oh, somebody wow. help. Wow. Yeah. Jeez, yeah. I did not expect that. Wow. Anyway, coming back to what I was saying. So the Indian music scene, uh, they will never give you charts. Very, yeah. very rare, you know. So you make your own charts and uh, very few readers, you know, in India. Like I said, it's very spontaneous, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. Like uh, you hear the music, you make your own notes, whatever the way you want. And uh, then the director usually or the composer usually will go like, okay, this is the vibe I'm going for. Uh, what do you think? Now you do what you want, yeah. you know? With AR, um, every time I've played for his movies, he's given me complete freedom. Mm -hmm. He'll not even brief, not even a little, like he'll be like just playing the song and he'll be like, okay, this is the key and uh, I'll just give my creative vision and I'll usually give him like different options, like a slap style, finger style, mm -hmm. and more percussive mm -hmm. uh, and then like very laid back and then he'll kind of mix it up. Mm. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. surprise me. He seems to be a really open collaborator yeah. in the way that he. Yeah, goes and about he's himself. very uh, particular um, about having certain musicians. Yeah. Like he wants them. And he will only want them because of a certain reason. Sure. Um, I would like to think that I am a pretty good mind reader. That's why I think I'm able to work with him at so much ease mm -hmm. throughout these sure. years yeah. Yeah. and uh we have fun yeah. even yeah. though we don't talk that much yeah. yes emails once in a while here, yeah. here and there, yeah, we, but... talk, we talk about that a lot when we watch musicians and bands do things and the the connectivity that you have when everything's going and you you, you are communicating with each other without saying anything and you you get an idea especially when you play with people long enough you know where they're probably going to go with something. There's a level of trust. Yeah, yeah. big yeah. level of trust. Yes. And you want to yeah. work with them again. Yeah. You, I, okay, so I've listened to the songs that are on the Apple playlist for your name. If you look at Mohini Day and the number of songs that are on mm -hmm. there, you you play stuff that I've, I've heard Screamo, I've heard Fusion, I've heard Jazz, I've heard a part that sounds Bluegrass. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you can play anything. Do you have preferences in terms of what's your favorite mm. things to play stylistically? I love fusion music, yeah. um, but I also love like um, Algero type of music, mm. like George Benson mm -hmm. type of music, which is really subtle and just kind of chill out with a little bit of Coke. I don't drink or smoke or anything. Coke? I mean Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> That was, my, that, was my next, that was my next question. Yes. You heard it here first, kids. Oh, I need to Do go coke back. before every music gig. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. From Mohini Day. I need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> the effect Paul would have. Yeah. <laughs> get get yeah. you a shirt that says Do coke. <laughs> I don't eat any vegetables. What? None whatsoever. None. What? Like, really? None. Zero. What? Yeah, no, there are no vegetables. talk about your event organizers. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so I categorize event organizers as vegetarian event organizers and non-vegetarian event organizers. Because of my one experience, I remember I was, you know, like all these now, about 17 years of my career, I have been my own manager throughout my yeah. journey, okay? So when people reach out to you, organizers, like music festivals and stuff, I remember this one person, I'm not going to take the name, but uh, he didn't know about this meat eater, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, he was from Bangalore. And uh, he wanted me to perform in a music festival, so you know, blah blah blah, business done. And I go, and they put me up in a vegetarian, uh, like a hotel. The buffet is vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I go down there, and I'm like, oh my god, what do I do now? Because I can't play now after this. Like, 
I don't get any energy after that. It's okay. like eating grass or yeah. something, you know? No <laughs> offense. I love vegetarian people. And <laughs> but, strict carnivore. That's right. Yeah, carnivore. Like hardcore carnivore. Anyway, so then I call him up and I'm like, you know, this is a problem. Like, I really need to eat like meat so that I can play for the show because I feel very weak right now. And he's like, okay, well, I'll take you to a restaurant. So then he drove me there. I ate my lunch and then we went sound check and did my show. After that, again, he took me to a restaurant and then I ate my meat again and then, you know, flew back. <laughs> <laughs> so from that time, I put in the tech writer saying yeah. only meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's just one of So those. that's some of the criteria. Like if someone's going to book you to do something, you're going to have the specialty list of what has to be on. Some people are like, I want my peanut M&Ms to be green. Right, right. So in my, in my case, it's just yeah, going to be like meat. non veg food. That's yeah. why we have a New York strip right there. Mm. Oh, that's why. That's true. Really? <laughs> She's like, right, really? <laughs> <laughs> on, on that, you do doing different styles of music. Um, and I, I, I've heard you say you, you like to do as many different styles as possible. Yeah. And we're both actors and so like often actors will say I like to do different style of roles to, to try to change it up and so I don't get bored is it right. the same for you oh yeah I love yeah. the fluctuation mm -hmm. very grateful that I uh, have been uh, this fortunate to be able to hop in and out of different situations one thing too long I get bored mm -hmm. yeah so I am I, I mean I do my own stuff when I get back to my hotel I have my recording set up I'll do my own music write my own songs and stuff uh, but uh, yeah, I I can say no when I want to. I'm fortunate that I can say no, that no, I don't want to do this right now because I am not feeling it. I've done this for too long. I want to do something else, yeah. you know? And with your own music, you can do that. Like, yeah. You can infuse sure. other things, you know? But like <laughs> when you're doing other people's music, you can't really do that because you have to serve the music and the director, not just the music, because liking and disliking is, liking is subjective from person to person. I might like something on their song and they might not, you know? Yeah. So reading that person's mind and uh, delivering a certain asset, yeah. very important in this type of music. Sure, sure. Or yeah. any creative field. Absolutely. So uh, I, I would guess then that the, the genre, the style that you probably like to play the most is, is going to fall into the fusion and jazz categories because of the flexibility funk, yeah, funk, yeah add funk because yeah. mm -hmm. it's got mm -hmm. it's got the written element it's got the freedom to be uh, yeah. improvisational and it also has technological it's got challenging things for you as far as the changing of the, the syncopation and the rhythms and yeah i'm very technical yeah 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 i can hear it we can hear it in yeah. the way you play mm -hmm. the other thing I, I don't know if you guys know this and i don't know how much you do it but you sing I sing. You can bit. sing really well. Yeah, a little bit. I had no idea. He knew. That Malik, you knew. No, he knew. So how much, <laughs> how much of that? Yeah, how much, how much is singing a part of what you do now? And do you see that as becoming more of what you do in the future? Uh, I don't want people to focus on my singing over my bass playing. Mm -hmm. for sure. Because sure. mm -hmm. uh, that has always been my first love. Right. But um, I'm doing more vocal music now because um, I want my set to be a good balance of everything. Uh, I want my set to be a good representation of what my journey has been. Right. Which is everything. Right. You know? Uh, where I've done conical, where I've done funk music, jazz, blah, blah, blah. Right. And now I'm singing too. So I need to put some of that. Right. So that's that why sense. I'm doing that. And for stupid babies who don't know what she's referring to when she says her set, she's not talking about when she's playing with other people. She's talking about when she does her own performances and right. she's representing herself and saying, okay, here's my show. Yeah. 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 So I'm not a musician. Rick is. So forgive me if any of these questions are dumb. Uh, but I've heard musicians say they when they when they see a piece of music or when they think of it like they they visualize it in a certain way. How do you see music when you when you think about it or read it? I it's very funny, but I see music as chunky glitter. A lot of people see it as colors, okay, which is there. Yeah. But for me, it's colored glitter. And by the way, that's, that was a good question okay. for a non for a non musician. <laughs> that was a yeah. good question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I see it as different colored glitters. Mm -hmm. um, I like to define music as a part of who I am, definitely, but also it's limited, not limited, unlimited. It's unlimited. Um, I don't like to restrict myself to uh, anything and be stuck on it, like I said. 
Um, I like to be open-minded and not define myself as just a musician because I can be other things too, no. you know? I am a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, uh, hopefully a mother someday. Um, and um, I, I can be a fashion designer, hopefully one day I can have my own clothing line. Mm -hmm. uh, I can be anything I want. I think human, human beings have that capacity to be anything they want. So when people say like, this is the only thing I know in life to do, which is great, but I, I know that I have more potential to be yeah. other things. Um, so my music is that too. Yeah. yeah. Now you've played with people who are legendary. Is there anyone you've yet to play with that you really want to play with? You know, I've never had any dreams or wishes to play with any person. Mm. And everything that has happened in my career has been, um, I've been very fortunate to have received those opportunities and to be able to play with so many legendary musicians. Uh, but yeah, there's there has never been that point in my life where I'm like, oh, I want to play with this musician. Mm -hmm. But uh, now that I have so many names on my plate and so many things that I love doing, I think I would love to be in a pop band, like mm -hmm. a proper pop band in LA, you know? Mm -hmm. That's why I'm here. Uh, I'm doing my own music, but on the side, I want to be able to experience that side of the scene too, because that's something I've never done. Mm -hmm. Indian pop scene is different. LA sure. pop scene is way different. Mm -hmm. So I want to do that too. Oh, Taylor yeah. Swift. <laughs> <laughs> or Bruno Mars. Yeah, I was just gonna say, that's what I was just going to say. Yeah. Bruno. Yeah, Bruno. Yes. Okay, that is more of a yes, legend. Yeah. Uh, speaking of legends that you've worked with and know, uh, Ustaji Zaki Hussein, uh, whom you've got to work with and know many times. Uh, whom we Did got... you say Zaki Hussein? Zaki Hussein. Zaki Hussein. Yes. Um, who is our dose? Um, well. <laughs> he was our first interview. He was our first Isn't ever crazy. Amazing. Uh, that's amazing. Our very first Imagine interview. he lives here. Out here yes, in he, yeah, he does. In San Francisco. Yeah. But really still, we were like, how did that happen? Yeah. yeah the but first I, time I played with him was I was I was only 13. 13 I had yeah. no idea I was going to play with him. I, go, I know that like story. Surprised. Yeah, your dad surprised you. It's like, oh, okay, hey, you're going to go play with that. that. <laughs> Good. That was yeah. my first on the spot performance, and I had no idea there was going to be like Jugal Bandi or something like that. But, I mean, and you knew who he was at 13. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. The moment I saw him sound checking there when I was there, I was like, oh my god, this is exciting. And then yeah, I'm, I'm gonna like, watch you're gonna him. play. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna watch him. And my like, uncle's gonna play with him. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I was almost in like tears, like, oh no, what am I gonna do? Like, not in happy tears, but like nervous tears. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know? At only 13, you know? Yeah. And no music was planned, nothing. So you just go and you just jam, right? And uh, Ranjit Anka was there, Naladri Kumar was there on sitar, Fazal Qureshi, who's Zakaji's brother. Uh, there were some other musicians, legendary musicians. And then I'm there in the corner, sitting on my chair with my huge bass, you know, and playing. I started with a little solo and then everybody kind of joined in and we did this Jugal Bandi. And I got so nervous in the Jugal Bandi, I was like, I looked at Zakaji as <laughs> no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> so I was not a part of that Jogo Bandi. That was my first, like, on the spot performance. And I said, no, Jogo Bandi. So I said, no. So they did the, the, their thing. And then after the show, I was really, like, sad. And he came up to me and he was like, you did so good, baby. Like, why are you crying? And I was like, no, I did not do good. And he was like, no, you were great. You're going to go so far. And he gave me, like, his words of wisdom. Yeah. And he was like, no, you're a genius, this and that. And then, like, Four years down the line after that, I play his show. I'm playing his music. He plays my music on the show too. <laughs> and then I was different. Then I was more powerful, mm -hmm. more wise, mm -hmm. you know, more mature, had a few more years of experience. And uh, yeah, that was like, and he was like, wow, you've grown so much and stuff. And I'm so proud of you. And then again, after a couple of years, uh, we played at uh, Abaji's. Um, uh, there's a every year he does this Abaji's uh, dedication performance. So he asked Ranji Danko to play his set, and I was playing there. And we were closing, and then he saw me again at like 17 or 18, and he was like, "Wow, you're like growing every day, every year, and I'm, you know, I can't wait to see what you do mm -hmm. in the industry." And that yeah. was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know how 
weird that is, right? <laughs> Sincerely, like for, for, a, for a 13 year old, and it was evident, like we said, when we saw the Berkeley, I, I've, I'm a musician, but I'm, I'm you know, I, I can play and I've had the honor of playing with people that's very strange. Like I've, I, I've actually been able to be in a band and do a set with Abraham Laboreal, which is weird. Oh, amazing. Which is, yeah, it's weird for me to be playing with Abraham Laboreal. But I, for a 13 year old to just without preparation be able to get up mm -hmm. and play with someone at that stature and that level yeah. and hold your own, uh, back to like what I said originally of knowing that you were better than the average bear, how do you keep yourself grounded and not let that go to your head? How do you keep yourself grounded? Because you obviously know when you're playing with these kinds of people, getting accolades like you're having publications and music say yeah. you are one of the greatest living bassists in the 21st century and the only woman in the list. Mm. How do you keep that from getting you to have a really big ego about that? I think uh, I was brought up with the right values, brought up in a strict Bengali culture at home, uh, taught me a lot of things about life and do's and don'ts, you know. Yeah. I think I was very fortunate to have my parents as musicians who understand, who understood the industry also sure. very well. So they gave, gave me uh, their set of like uh, experiences that they had in the past. When they got married um, in Calcutta, none of their family members were happy about it because they were not like the same cast. And then mm. I, then mom had me and they were not happy because I was a girl and all this like, you know, drama was happening. So they just decided they'll just move to a different city and both were musicians. They wanted to make it big in the music industry. So they just, you know, stuck together and they said, yes, we're just gonna do music and just work hard and not care about what others think. So they just cut off every connection with the relatives, you know? So I always only had my mom and dad as my friends and family. Me and my sister, my younger sister, she plays guitar. She's three, younger, three years younger to me. And we both were brought up with the same set of values and we were not allowed to have any friends growing up in school. Uh, we had a very, very strict um, uh, routine every day, getting up 5.30 a.m. in the morning, going to school, coming back by 12.30, having your lunch, freshen up, private tutor comes home, two to three hours she would teach me, you know, and then she would go away and do your classes homework and then do your school homework and then music practice, have your dinner and then go to sleep by like 11, 12 and then again, all over again, every day. This was every day, you know? Um, was that hard? Of course, it was hard. But I see it now, like why that was important. I Now my friends are still in college, still trying to figure out what they want to do in life and now I have a house, I have everything yeah. that I never even dreamt of. I get it. And the discipline you have as an artist because yes. I know that that gave you, a lot of it's inherent, but you, you that gave you this design of how to discipline yourself. And like you said, was work. it easy to, right. uh, you know, be around people um, as a 13 year old, 14 year old, you're seeing other people like, <laughs> you know, doing things in front of you, smoking up, drinking, blah, 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 doing all that yeah. and uh, not get carried away by that stuff, right, you right. know? And when I took up my stand and I wanted to do things by myself and wanted to travel by myself, for the longest time, my, one of my parents, either one of them would always travel with me. Mm. Uh, till like 17 and then by 18 I started traveling by myself sure and could I have slipped away then yeah, yes absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I think those years of uh, discipline kind of uh, had a great foundation uh, on me yeah and uh, I'm very very thankful for that uh, could they have done differently probably <laughs> but uh, it worked yeah. you know now i get it now i'm very very thankful to them and i'm like but back then i was like man this is like always fights you know this and that now we're at a better place and now we're like you know now i get it and i'm very very thankful to you and now we share a space where we can talk about things um my father being a bass player actually <laughs> him and I, we stopped talking actually because having two musicians in the family sometimes can be very, very <laughs> hard <laughs> and like the same instruments. Right. And I was working, I was taking away his jobs. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. When you said, <laughs> I, I thought about that, I was like, how did your dad feel about the fact you got to play with Air Ramon? <laughs> and, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. started working with Hariyaran. 
I started right. working with Salim Suleiman. I started working with Amit sure. Trivedi. I was playing everywhere. I was taking up everybody's yeah. jobs, you know? And that was yeah, not good. Bring up some tension. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was not good. I mean, obviously, that was not the intention my, at all. No, yeah. My, no. my dad can relate on a much smaller level because when I got into the Partridge family, he was on a track for the music <laughs> career and everything stopped. And they, they hired him to write the songs I sang, but for him, it was like, anybody want to hear what my, I'm doing? <laughs> Yeah, so that happens. I think there is a culture shock that everybody goes through when th things are being done for the very first time. They were first time parents too, right. you know? They didn't know how to bring children up. It was, they were going through failures and I was going through failures, mm -hmm. my set and their set, you know? So there were a lot of clashes. And yeah. then after like two years of not speaking and then him seeing that, oh, I have a house of myself, you know, I, I, uh, of mine and then I was able to take my own decisions and I was an independent woman already by 1920 and he saw that and he was like you know I'm very proud of you and I take all those things back I said Good. he you said know? he said that yeah to you? he said that's that. beautiful and I was like yeah that's, that's great. great awesome <laughs> Um, so here's here's a question. I've heard some musicians and artists in general get upset when like people say they have a natural gifting, God gift or whatever, right? Um, where and because they think it discredits all the work that they put in to this. So where do you think the line is between a natural gifting somebody has and all the work that they they get? Um, right. And that's a great question actually. When uh, I am being told like you know you are so blessed mm -hmm. already. Yeah. Um, you can have the blessings, mm -hmm. but you have to make the time to build it, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to make it something. I think every baby has a blessing. Mm -hmm. I think we as human beings, we have the power within us to take control over our lives. I always say like our destiny is in our own hands. Mm -hmm. You know, if I would have made the choice of, uh, going into fashion college, I probably wouldn't have been able to spend eight and a half years with AR in his band or any of his movies, right. never would have played in movies. So I think choices make a huge difference. Evaluation is very important. Um, but uh, yes, there is that fine line and sometimes you don't know. Uh, that's why it's important to uh, be open-minded and uh, weigh the pros and cons and what you really want from your life. Mm. where you want to be in life and I was able to do that at a young age because I was very mature for my age because uh, I was already playing with 55 year olds 45 year olds when I was so young <laughs> right so I started talking like 55 year olds you know and then people were like how old are you like you talk like you're 70 or something I'm like uh I'm like 17 you know? <laughs> like even today when I go out work in the industry I'm like you talk like you're like you're like in your 50s and stuff I'm like, how old are you I'm like I'm just 25 now you know yeah I think the yeah. wisdom came from all these years of working with so many uh, musicians who had such great insight on life and they were able to share that with me mm -hmm. and I was able to take those learnings and apply that to mine. Now I'm not saying when, when I do my master classes and workshops people come up to me and they say like um, can you give me a set of like your learning experiences so that I can watch out and you know apply that to mine. I say that don't follow my footsteps yeah. because my background was totally different and yours is completely different. Yeah. My experiences will not apply to yours. You will have your set of experiences yeah. and you will have your set of learnings, you know? Mm -hmm. So I say don't follow, keep your ears open, obviously, so you can take the good parts out of it, but your evaluation and result is never going to be the same. Everybody has their own story, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Everybody should be proud enough to share that. Share that. Yeah. Yeah. What are things that everybody should know about who's watching this that you currently are either doing and you want them to know, or is coming up? Like you said, you have master classes that you do. Yes. You have a gig that's coming up, which yeah. I know is not yes. the only gig coming up. <laughs> uh, so, what are things that we can know about and support you in, and you want people to know about? So the upcoming one is on the 27th and 28th of November uh, at Alva Showroom uh, in San Pedro, and I am playing uh, some of my new music from my upcoming album. So if you want to be the first one to hear my upcoming album's music, then come out there. Uh, and um, that is, those are the only two shows where they're going to be able to hear this new set of music, mm. and then I'm not going to play. Okay. Because this is more like a promotional 
shows mm -hmm. kind of a thing. I'm yeah. shooting everything and I'm not going to be putting out because I want my people to hear the music on the record. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is just a little teaser yeah. for them, you know? So yeah, a lot of my new music, a lot of my old music that I always did. Um, and um, uh, I also give out Skype lessons, Zoom lessons, and uh, people can uh, reach out to mohini.dey662 at gmail.com for that, uh, for bookings and inquiries. And uh, I do, lately I've been doing a lot of recording sessions for a lot of people. So I have a huge client diary that I work for. Uh, every day I'm like recording over, on record, recording on over like three songs. And uh, those uh, are getting released in December. So mm -hmm. watch out for those. So a lot of like uh, all the confidential stuff. So a lot of the stuff that people see on Instagram and YouTube is not the only thing that happens. Oh, sure. Some are uh, paid to be put out and some are paid to be kept under covers. So right. those undercover stuff is coming out those things are coming yes. out in December, so yeah. Cool. And I'll put all the links for all that in the description below, including you can follow her on Instagram and uh, you have a YouTube channel as well. Yes. 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 Subscribe to my YouTube channel. So I'll put that in the description as well. You can go subscribe to her. I will. Thank you so much for talking to us. I want to finish this off with a little bit of rapid fire. Oh yeah. 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 Fun little rapid fire questions here. First off, coffee or chai? Chai. Um, <laughs> Indrani's applauding. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite uh, Indian meal? Oh man, that's a hard one. Meat. Meat yeah, or meat. meal? No, yes. but I, I was saying it's gotta be meat oriented. Oh, yeah. a lamb. There Indian, you go. Lamb, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and. Like kosha mansho. Kosha mansho. Yes. Yes. I thought it would have been super chicken or mutton biryani. Oh. Meat, though, they asked. Yeah, yeah. Meat is a meal. No, yeah, meal. I said oh, meat, meal. assuming it would be meat oriented. Well, there's so many meals I like, but yeah. sukkah chicken is the one of them. Like the local dhaba style yeah, sukkah yeah. chicken. Mutton biryani. Yeah. 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 Um, favorite Indian film? Indian film. See, that's a hard one. I don't watch movies at all. The last Even time. You were a kid? You didn't watch movies? I was busy <laughs> making my life. <laughs> Will you watch movies that they hire you to do bass on for the score? No. <laughs> <laughs> What's a Indian film you've seen? I can't even remember. He was <laughs> hardcore into music. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we get it. That's all right. That's yeah. awesome. So I, I would sometimes watch movies if I'm like flying, taking a long right, flight sure. somewhere. Then I would. I don't remember. Watch, when you're flying, watch Doom 3. Now we can't. <laughs> Fantastic. That I've seen, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Doom, Doom yeah. 2, Doom 3, yeah. I've seen. Okay. okay. All right. We have not. <laughs> uh, favorite Indian curse word? No, you can say you it. You can say it on this you channel. Can say it. Look at his coffee cup. It says Marachod. <laughs> Work with me, they have never even heard an F word out of my mouth. Oh, yeah. all right, yeah. fine. I never. thought I could squeeze it out of you. Okay, yeah. uh, who is, in your opinion, the greatest bassist of all time? Oh, great time? question. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, there are so many. Um, Little couple that you really love. Uh, okay, um, all time favorite yeah. Jacob Pistorius, uh, Abraham Laborio, uh, John Patitucci, mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Miller, Stanley Clark, uh, mm -hmm. Juan Carter. From that generation, you know, mm. of course, Victor Wooten. Uh, now, uh, a lot of uh, amazing bass players have been coming out with the social media presence. Yes. So, some to name would be uh, Hadrian Perot, mm. Anton David Yams, Junior Bragger now. Um, yeah, many actually. Mm. John Ferreira, Ricky Bonazzo. And, many. <laughs> and less. Same question, but guitarist. Oh, uh, Guthrie Govan. Okay. Mm. Uh, from Aristocrats, mm -hmm. um, Alan Holdsworth, uh, ah, so many. Yeah. Um, yeah. Frank Gumbale, uh, Van Halen, Steve Vai, of course. Yeah. So many. Yeah. And do you, I'm assuming you like classic rock. Yeah. I, I'm a big classic rock fan. Who's, yeah. who's your favorite classic rock band? Rock band? Yeah. Uh, so I've not listen to much of rock music. I was never into rock or like that heavy sort of, mm -hmm. although I play heavy music, but I never have listened to like heavy metal music or rock music that much. Uh, I have listened to bands like Chikoria, uh, Weather Report, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Extraction, um, 
level 42 uh, a lot of these like pop funk bands growing up yeah. so hard to tell but um yeah i don't know do you know any classic rock bands i mean i know the bands but i don't think you have really listened to them no before. yeah you mainly listen to fusion music fusion yeah music, yeah, the, yeah where the bass playing is extremely active right something kind about of in rock the music is that yeah. the, the guitar and the vocals right. are in the forefront yeah the bass is really holding down a groove yeah. exactly uh, in the music that Bohemia is mainly listening to, it's very active bass playing. Right. And that's why you hear, while you can hold it down, yeah. you're an active bass player. Right. Yeah, like you will never hear me play that sort of stuff in AR's band. Yeah, right. Uh, a lot of people in the comment section will be like, oh my god, she plays too much, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm like, <laughs> have you seen me in AR's band? <laughs> yeah. you know? Just listen to the songs on the Apple playlist and you'll recognize that she can lay back and just provide yeah. the groove. Yeah. It's, but if you're coming out to my show, then you will hear a lot of bass notes. Yeah, <laughs> you good. Know? Absolutely. And funky music, where yeah. I'm singing and playing funk stuff. So, yeah, I think a good balance is good. Otherwise, yeah. people will get bored. I get bored yeah. playing the same sort of music. Like, if you hear metal music for, like, half an hour, that's the max I can take. After yeah, like that, pop, I get headaches. In pop music, one of my favorite bass lines is one of the most active ones, and it's in uh, Duran Duran's Rio. Because that bass line is just the song. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. And on, since you said you one day you like to start your own fashion line, who are some of your fashion inspirations? Oh, I, I, so my fashion is very whack. Today what you see is very like formal and like, you know, feminine. But otherwise, on a normal day basis, you will see me like wear a lot of like safety pins stuff. Like, uh, my fashion sense is very, uh, what do you call that? Like a very... Eclectic. Yeah. Yeah. Exotic, mm -hmm. flush, yeah. and uh, also very colorful. Not a not very like solid colors, but yeah. a lot of mix, a lot, lot of rainbow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every time we've seen you on video, you've always had great style. Yeah. Those outfits absolutely. are actually made by me, designed they? by me. That's awesome. Yeah. You're planning on starting a, a, a line one day, hopefully. Right? Yes, that's yeah. the plan. Uh, I've been taking <laughs> a lot of stitching classes so I can professionally stitch. You know, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, lately. Like now I've been seeing that in LA there are opportunities like that where you can hire people and they can come home and you know do that. So I've been doing that in my off time where I'm taking stitching les lessons. As a kid growing up, I was just like, you know, hand stitching everything and it would take days for me, me, me to complete one outfit yeah. out of my, you know, torn mom's sari. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with us. It was an absolute pleasure. You're such, a, such a wonderful person. It's great to talk to. Yeah. Obviously so you're extremely talented and uh, we're so looking forward to everything you have coming up. Oh, thank uh, and, you so much. Yeah, you really uh, said this the first time we heard you and I've been paying attention to you, obviously, since the day we saw you. And uh, there was somebody on TikTok who posted a bassist and they put something over the top that said best bassist in the world. And I wrote down, have you heard Mohini Day? And I didn't say that just to be argumentative or silly. I, I, you've heard the accolades a lot, but like I've heard Abraham Laboreal a lot. <laughs> yes. And when I heard you, I think when we stopped recording, I may have even said to Corbin, I said, I haven't heard anybody play the bass like that since Abraham Laboreal. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that so we, we really not only are uh, enamored with the creativity that you have, but we're, we are big supporters in Elevative Artistry, and you are the pinnacle for us thank you so of, much, of yeah. what a bassist is, is supposed to be about, both in the creative outflow that you do, but also the mindset you just shared and, yeah. and why you do what you do. So it's, it is a joy to have you here to talk with us because this is everything that we are about in regard to supporting and celebrating great artists. And I appreciate you guys doing this. This is so beautiful. Yeah. I'm happy to we be can't a part help of it. this. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.